Assalamu alaikum uh, and welcome to the uh, the Bob Lab Policy Roundtable. This conversation is, uh, I think, the most difficult of the of the conversations we've tried to have in this last few days about the situation in Afghanistan. Because although every every conversation uh, is about the people, uh, because ultimately, what is a country or a land or an issue or a group if it's not about the people? But in particular, the um, the visuals and the narratives and the stories from uh, the Hamid Karzai International Airport since the 16th of August, I think have left a lump in the throats of any any human being anywhere in the world um, that thinks about their own life and uh, its, its value, that thinks about their hopes and dreams and their aspirations, that thinks about the ability to freely express and profess who, who they are, what they are, what they believe in, uh, and wants to pursue a better life uh, for anyone that has had any of those sentiments. And that would probably be every single one of us. Watching what's been going on at the Hamid Karzai International Airport has been uh, really, really painful and difficult. And it was, uh, I think, in many ways, last night's uh, terrorist attack at the Hamid Karzai. <laughs> the fatalities, uh, the numbers still aren't complete. The way that the Western press in particular has dealt with it, um, there have been newspapers that have highlighted uh, only the uh, the casualties or the fatalities uh, from the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Navy. Um, others that have focused on that, of course, they deserve uh, as much focus as any human life, but uh, there are maybe as many as 150 Afghans uh, that are no longer alive. And then maybe to top off the tragedy and to really put our conversation today in really stark focus is the fact that the Hamid Karzai International Airport was completely uh, overwhelmed today, much in the way that it has been the last few days, which signals the extreme uh, conviction and intent and maybe desperation, if that's, uh, if that's an appropriate word, um, with which Afghans seek to, or at least those Afghans that are at the airport seek to exit the country. What is, there's a human element to this that is immediate, uh, and, and I think it does merit uh, conversation, but there are also uh, elements of this that will have profound implications for Afghanistan uh, in the weeks and months and years potentially to come. Particularly if we think about this, uh, this situation, not just as people seeking refuge or safety, but also as Afghanistan's premier talent, its premier human capacity, its human capital. Uh, if we see this exiting the country and exiting the system in the way that it has, and this continues, then one of the immediate uh, key questions that I think Afghanistan and the Taliban will need to answer, but its implications will be felt not just by all Afghans, but by, by its neighbors and by countries far and wide, uh, which is who's going to run Afghanistan? Who's going to manage the telecom responsibilities of keeping the towers running and keeping the 3G and 4G signals going? Who's going to make sure that the power sector is uh, you know, adequately sourced with the fuel and the expertise that it needs to keep the electricity running? Who's going to run the banks? We've already seen uh, a number of issues there with the banks having been uh, closed for four or five days and only yesterday being open. Um, despite all of the economic crises and economic challenges uh, and the resource constraints that Afghanistan faces, perhaps the biggest resource constraint that's building up in Afghanistan is human capital. If all the talent in Afghanistan, or at least the higher end talent in Afghanistan, most of it ends up leaving the country, then what does that say or do for the future of the prospects of the Taliban being a normal, uh, a normal governing structure and behaving in the way that the international community needs to expect them to and needs to hold them to account to. Uh, to engage in this discussion, we wanted to, uh, the ideal situation would have been a panel full of Afghans, but uh, much to our, I wouldn't say chagrin, but to our disappointment, but also uh, a disappointment that is not, uh, is not too profound in the sense that there is an understandable hesitation and an understandable lack of time 
amongst many, many talented Afghans all over the world whose principal responsibility right now is to ensure the safety and well-being of their loved ones, to help secure safe exit and safe evacuations for those that are eligible and those that are not. But, but that's where I think global Afghan talent has been focused. Nevertheless, we've been lucky to have been joined in all three conversations over the last 10 days uh, by some amazing Afghans, and, and we're lucky to be joined today by Harun Rahimi, um, who is a lecturer at the Afghan University uh, at the American University uh, of Afghanistan? I'm grateful to you, Harun, for making the time uh, on, on reasonably you. short notice, uh, and I think yours is an important voice, and I'm glad that you're part of it. I also want to quickly just introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, we're joined by Nasser bin Nasser, uh, who heads up a, a vital uh, Middle Eastern think tank, is based in Amman, Jordan, has worked in government, outside government, and has. Uh, worked on issues of migration and refugee, both refugee well-being and livelihoods, but also how refugees engage and, uh, and normalize within the new environments that they're in. Of course, the Middle East being the ground zero for two, three, four generations of refugee crises, beginning with, of course, the original sin of the Middle East, which is the Palestinian displacement and continuing through to the most recent mass uh, sort of evacuations and migration out of Syria into Turkey, into uh, Lebanon, and into uh, Jordan. Uh, Nasir, it's so great to have you with us, and I'm grateful uh, for, for your time and really looking forward to hearing your views. We're also lucky to be joined by Indrika Ratwate, uh, somebody who anybody that's ever worked with refugees in South Asia or Afghanistan, uh, they know Indrika by, by name, and uh, they have his phone number and they don't hesitate to call him. Indrika has a long track record as a, as a leading light at the UNHCR, uh, both at headquarters in New York and around the world. Um, Indrika is somebody that has a profound understanding of the issues bo on both sides of the divide, both the countries that are experiencing the crises that generate out migration, but also the countries uh, to which those people arrive in. And that empathy and understanding I think is helped serve many refugees around the world, but I've seen the incredible work that Indrika has done uh, with Afghan refugees here in Pakistan. So thank you for a lifetime of service to people that didn't have the voice or the power that you did, Indrika, and for transferring and sharing that power. It's really important that you're part of this conversation. Grateful thank to you. you. And uh, I don't know if uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa has joined us yet. So Lisa Schuster from the City University of London, uh, somebody who's got an incredible breadth and experience and range of uh, uh, research and, and understanding and analysis on Afghanistan over many years, including livelihoods and uh, refugee remigration, resettlement. Uh, Lisa is going to be joining us, I, I hope, very shortly as soon as we resolve some of the technical issues. Um, gentlemen, with your permission, I'm going to ask Harun to maybe just take the floor without any specifics, Harun. Just talk to me a little bit about being Afghan at this point in time, watching what's been happening at the airport, matching what your personal interests, where your family is, where your loved ones are, where your colleagues and friends are, how they're getting out, which ones are choosing to stay, how you're talking to them, what they're saying to you, and then processing the pain, uh, I assume, but, but please correct me if I'm wrong, but the pain of watching yet another example of Afghanistan's latest experiment having been dispensed with and a new one beginning. Uh, the floor is yours, Harun. No, thank you. Um, I cannot imagine where to begin uh, to cover all those topics, and I don't think I will. Um, in terms of how I feel about all of this, I haven't really fully processed it, as I think most Afghans haven't. Uh, we are just living through it, and at some point, I hope um, I will have the time to actually reflect and try to make sense of it all. As you said, many of us um, are just trying to reach out to loved ones, friends, families, our network, anyone who needs any kind of help, uh, just make ourselves available to them. Um, could be as little as just having a phone conversation with someone who is inc incredibly anxious, afraid of their future. Uh, it could be um, helping someone navigate an application process. It could be um, translating a letter for someone who wants to reach out to a former employer and uh, to a, a government um, uh, in the United States or in the UK government official uh, trying to get them to look at their cases. Um, it could be just um, trying to do what we can in terms of easing the financial pain 
uh, that many people are going through now that, uh, as you said, banks are closed, people don't have access to their savings. Um, the half a million Afghans who relied on government salaries, their sal their, their, they don't know if they have a job, whether they will receive salary or not. So there is an immense um, economic pressure that many people are facing in Afghanistan. So that's kind of what I have I've been. It's not about like, I feel like mostly numb at this point, just pushing through. But those are the things that kind of um, uh, fill my time. I'm also talking to media, trying to um, at least raise awareness, be there, engage, and don't leave the space to uh, many who maybe with good intentions do not may not appreciate all the uh, kind of different facets of what's going on in the country. In terms of uh, how Afghans are feeling, that's a um, that's a very complicated question to answer. I think um, there are many pieces to it. Uh, um, there was, uh, after Taliban were able to cause the collapse of Afghan state, um, and they were able to quickly take over many cities, there was a mixed reaction. Uh, one thing it meant was that the war was over, so many were feeling a respite, just the fighting be over, regardless of which side they, they allied with, they was, there was a welcome development that there will be no longer bombing, there will be no longer actual fighting, that their children or themselves would get caught uh, in, in the crossfire that they, many people told me that now feel they feel they can actually just move around the city, move around, especially in rural areas. They felt like they could go out at night. One person told me they could use uh, um, now flashlights. In the past, they were not using flashlights because they were uh, afraid of attracting a drone or, or, uh, or some sort of uh, a plane over their head and they, they feared they could be targeted. So I mean, there was a, that feeling of relief that the war is over as Taliban announced and many people in Afghanistan felt it, believed it, and they were welcoming it. There was also, at the same time, even those people who may have welcomed that development, there was a fear of future, like what is going to be now? What's going to happen now? Would I be able to make a livelihood? Um, as you know, Afghanistan economy, Afghanistan government, which was a big part of the Afghan economy, was all dependent on, it was kind of an, uh, an economy that was dependent heavily on foreign money, foreign aid. Um, I mean, UNFP, just one example of it, said that Afghans, some Afghans who were displaced because of the war um, that was ongoing until weeks ago, and needed just food. If the food did not get to them, they may actually not have anything to eat as soon as September because all the ways to the country was blocked. The airway was obviously um, being used for the evacuation. You had other Afghans who saw the Taliban take over with horror. They saw everything they worked for, everything they believed in, everything they, they tried to build just vanish in front of their eyes. And they were in disbelief. They did not, they felt like lost because uh, they felt, a lot of them, including me, felt a deep anger towards those who were in charge for the past 20 years, uh, more particularly towards the end. Um, they, did, they, didn't, they were kind of people without, a, without um, leadership. Um, they were people who poured their lives, uh, most of them, most of their other lives, in working for a vision of Afghanistan, uh, which may not have been fully implemented, was, uh, but was a vision that many Afghans subscribed to, dedicated their lives to, and worked honestly to, to make it possible. It was a vision of a democratic, pluralistic Afghanistan, uh, which was a good place for everyone to live in. Uh, so those people saw the Taliban take over as with her, um, we're just feeling like everything is lost. They feel were feeling deeply um, uh, uh, threatened, and they felt like they could be targeted. They, and their lives were in danger. They were in hiding. They just went in hiding, and um, they pleaded find try to find ways to get out of the country and at that point it was just basically Kabul airport left because all other that were controlled by the uh, Americans and that the that kind of pressure on Kabul airport became kind of led to the uh, and obviously lack of planning and just the, the fact that the uh, collapse was quote unquote unexpected uh, even to the intelligence community apparently led to the tragedies that we saw in Afghanistan so some of those kind of some, some of the things that happened obviously there's mo a lot more to explore there. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that uh, sort of kind of introductory, uh, I guess, ground setting or, or stage setting, Harun. I think it's uh, really important. Let me um, also, you know, since since you've been speaking, maybe just continue a little bit and talk to us a little bit. Welcome, Dr. Lisa Schuster. Um, yeah. So happy uh, for you to join us. I, I'm just going to ask Harun to continue. Harun's given us a quick overview of uh, where things are at right now. And I, I think maybe now sort of focusing in on the topic, uh, you know, there's two elements to the refugee crisis. And I think that for so many European countries uh, and, and for, for the US, for Canada, for a lot of the Western powers, the conversation is about how many refugees they'll take, how many they won't take, what is an SIV, what is a refugee, what is a visa. 
Uh, obviously, in the neighborhood, whether it's Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and especially Iran and Pakistan, the question is, you know, whether the gates should be let open, uh, whether it should be moderated, whether it should be managed. Uh, we shared a little bit of data early on, uh, you know, where we've seen over the last six months, there's been a massive return of Iranians, uh, of Afghans from Iran. Um, uh, not so much the same numbers from Pakistan. But in all of these conversations, the focus seems to be those countries. So the conversation is about how great Justin Trudeau is. And, and he's great. That, that's fantastic. I love it, right? I love his socks. I love, you know, that he looks better than me without a shirt. That's awesome. But uh, there's a question about the people actually involved. There are thousands of people getting into planes and leaving their country, not knowing whether they're ever going to go back. There's an immediate emotional and human element to it. I think we've dealt with that a little bit, although, again, all of us should free, feel free to speak about. The big question that I was pondering over the last five or six days as I was watching these flights leave and knowing some of the people that were on those flights was who's going to fill that job that that person was doing? Well, not to name any names, but, you know, we've seen dozens of ministers, dozens of senior officials, their entire families, students at the universities, teachers at the universities just exit the country. What is the hollowing out of the top shelf of Afghan talent, human capital, going to do to the prospects of a Taliban-run Afghanistan, Harun? I mean, just to pick, take your first like comment, um, I share your sentiment that uh, often um, some of the conversations about the Kabul airport is turning to a lot of people patting themselves on the back. Uh, um, in the United States, even President Biden has spent a lot of time saying how impressive the uh, evacuation uh, um, um, kind of was conducted, how the U.S. was the greatest force in the world that could have done what they did. And I'm actually have, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for any country uh, to, that welcomes refugees. I think that's a, a, good, a sign of good national character, and they should. But you're right, and in terms of like unbalance, that's kind of seen, seen being the focus. Like, um, I don't want to use the trope of white savior, but we've seen that there was like people on CNN talking about how they got up seven women uh, in a country of 35 million people, and that story gets kind of central focus, and it turns into the kind of a story about heroism of a, a white American woman who was able to save seven Afghan girls. I understand that's some what the media is going at, but the, the reality underground is much more complex. Um, there are many countries uh, in the region going to have to deal with a lot more serious issues um, than, than many in Canada ever will with regard to the uh, uh, unfolding of what's happening in Afghanistan. With regard to the, uh, your um, second uh, issue of what's going to happen to Afghanistan now, the, is, the brain drain is, uh, is real. Uh, so there are many aspects to this. One uh, part of Afghans are incredibly angry. They see, they saw the political elites in particular, not maybe the technical uh, component of the government, but the political elite in particular, they saw them as lacking commitment to the country. They were call, often called dual citizens uh, in a derogatory terms. They were called in derogatory ways. They were called Tommy boys uh, in a derogatory way, just signaling that the population felt like those in charge did not have commitment to them, just because of the fact that they uh, maintained this outsider kind of view of the country, their outsider status to, to the eyes of most Afghans. So to some, uh, this um, leaving feels like an abandonment of those who wrecked the country and now just leaving. And they look at most Afghans with just horror and anger and resentment. But at the same time, as you pointed out, there were um, like the brightest Afghans who were responsible for making the telecommunication work. They were responsible for making the media work, which was a great success story of the past 20 years. They were the people who were in civil society organizing like people on the street demonstrating and such they were people who m made sure that the uh, airlines were actually flying pilots and such even inside the army i mean taliban were smart enough to say that we would like the pilots to remain because how long it's going to take how much money it's going to take to train another pilot we can actually fly a plane or or, uh, or uh, operate a, a sophisticated machinery those are gone and I think Taliban attempt to um, do outreach and try to calm people to stay hasn't worked for different reasons. Some of those rhetorics are not backed by actions. Uh, there, uh, there's not a lot of credibility. There's not a lot of trust uh, for obvious reasons. Until very recently, Taliban were conducting a brutal, uh, a brutal uh, um, kind of uh, insurgency. Just give you one example to put in the context of why people choosing to leave, despite some of the rhetorics of the Taliban. 
if take my my university for example if uh just i'm not talking about anyone in particular if one professor at american university of Afghanistan chooses to leave you have to realize that the american university of Afghanistan was targeted by the hapai network in 2014. so they sent gunmen to our university going door to door inside the classrooms it was not a military institution it was just a university going door to door looking for students and faculty to shoot they killed many of our students they killed many of our colleagues and the person who's at the top of that network is now in kabul doing outreach telling people that always just in the past just let's move on stay i mean in terms of the credibility of that message you have to realize like how it would come across uh, uh, to a, a population um, that was seen uh, by the many uh, uh, elements of the taliban as the enemy and was hunted down killed until very recently so there are people are leaving the gap is real and the taliban outreach doesn't seem to have credibility but at the same time there are some political elites who are leaving and people are looking at them with disgust because they blame them for what happened in the country it's a complex picture i'm so grateful i don't it really is a very complex picture uh, Dr. Schuster, the, you know, you've been, you've been studying this country and, and human uh, dynamics and, you know, inflows and outflows of Afghan talent for many years. Uh, you know, sitting in Islamabad is one vantage point, but I think looking at this from an academic lens uh, really lends uh, a lot of weight to, you know, what your views are on this. I want to, I guess maybe I want to start by asking you to frame what Harun has just said in terms of complexity. Given this complexity, it seems pretty stark, the prospects of the Taliban having any shot at making this work. Whether, I mean, clearly it's not just the the, the, the complexity of having people from the Haqqani network running Kabul essentially now. I mean, essentially the, the mayor is the mayor, but I believe he's reporting to or, you know, contingent on the security provided by the HQN in Kabul. Uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the memory or the residual sort of feeling uh, from, from these kinds of postings or assignments is going to scare people and drive people to the airport and to the borders to seek refuge. This isn't going to get solved in a week or, or 10 days or, or, or five years. I'm not sure it was solved in the 20 years of the Republic. Um, so, so what are we looking at here in terms of human capital? Is there going to be any, is there any kind of, uh, I don't know, silver lining here in terms of people that might stay in Afghanistan and help build whatever state structure is going to be required to sustain normal life, if, if any such thing exists, even in the country? Dr. Schuster. Very difficult to say. I mean, I think Haroon has perfectly summed up, as he said, the complexity of the situation. Um, I think that he's right in that there is the elite leaving and that elite is also heterogeneous so it includes those people he referred to who have been essentially siphoning, siphoning aid money into their back pockets building themselves wonderful palaces and then leave as soon as possible but i was working in the ministry for refugees until 10 days ago and was really impressed by some of those bright young people who were talking to me about creating a better future for Afghanistan, even against a backdrop of an incredibly volatile and fragile situation. Those people are unable to leave. Um, I mean, over the last 10 days, there have been enormous attempts to help them get out. And all of these thousands of people have been removed, but that's a minority. So those people are still there, those young, ambitious people who wanted to do something for their country. So there is a reservoir of people there, if that's what the Taliban want. And it's not obvious that they do. Um, certainly their behavior so far is not encouraging those people to go back to work or to make the same commitment. And why should they? There's also a huge reservoir of feminine talent that is now being excluded because people are genuinely afraid. Um, women that I have worked with who are now staying at home and very worried about what's going to happen. As I say, there is this incredible reservoir of talent there, people like Haroon, um, but I'm not sure that the Taliban have the will or the desire to tap into that. Um, I don't think that they have what it takes to persuade those people that there is something worth fighting for or worth staying for. 
I think what's more likely to happen, and I'd be interested to hear what Haroon says about this, is that people will hunker down and wait until they can leave in the future, or hunker down and hope that the Taliban regime will collapse and that there will be a new regime in which they can play a role. Uh, uh, Dr. Schuster, that's a pretty stark, I mean, I thought I was kind of negative or maybe a little too grim in my own sort of understanding of this, uh, but what you've done is confirmed that grimness and actually maybe even uh, profoundly exacerbated it, uh, not through any fault of your own, but obviously I, I think, you know, we're clutching at straws here in terms of looking for something that might uh, give us some hope to be, you know, maybe less uh, less negative uh, and, and, and more positive than what we've seen over the last 10 days, which has been not just the scenes at the airport, but I think more broadly, some horrific scenes in terms of how journalists have been treated. I think there's a little bit too much congratulatory sort of uh, sentiment as far as, you know, they're gonna let schools run. Well, they're gonna let schools run should have been a minus zero type thing, not, not a net positive. If, if we're con congratulating the Taliban for letting schools run, then I, I, I fear that the greatest public diplomacy victory of the Taliban is that they've changed the, they've, they've shifted the spectrum uh, to something that's more comfortable for them. Uh, and, and so that's why I think these conversations are super important. But I want to just ask you, Dr. Schuster, to maybe just speak a little bit more about what we can predict about Afghan refugee and Afghan migrant families, given the experience of the last 40 years, that once once an Afghan family does out-migrate, what are the likelihood or the chances of them resettling in Kabul or in Herat or in Mazad, coming back and contributing to the civil service or to the banking and finance sector or to IT and telecom or like Harun, uh, to working at a university and shaping young minds? One of the things that I, has really struck me, so I've been working with um, people from Afghanistan now for about 15 years, working generally on migration for 30 years. But in the, the time that I have spent with Afghan refugees in Europe, what has profoundly struck me is that the first thing that Afghans do once they get papers is they go home. There is a really strong attachment to Afghanistan. And in the years that I've spent in Kabul and in Baghlan, what I have seen are very many Afghans who do go back. Some of them go back to set up businesses. Um, as you've described, um, it has been returnees who have been, I think, mostly responsible for the telecommunications industry in Afghanistan. Um, others have come back to contribute to education. I don't think that they will come back under the Taliban, but I think that there is this reservoir of talent. I'm sure that there is this re reservoir of talent but as soon as it becomes feasible, will return. It's not easy. There are difficulties. I've met many um, Afghans who have returned after years spent either in Iran or in Europe who have found it difficult to settle for different reasons in Afghanistan. Um, but frankly, it is only those Afghans and the Afghans who remain in Afghanistan, who don't leave, which is the majority of Afghans, who are going to be able to rebuild Afghanistan in the future. What we can see is that over the last 20 years, foreigners like myself who have gone into Afghanistan have achieved close to nothing. Um, what we've done is we've sucked up, we've sucked up a lot of the development and aid money um, without actually managing to create anything useful in the country. Um, everything that we've done has been incredibly fragile and largely because it's been driven by a profit motive. It's been research consultancies. It's been foreign security companies that have sucked up the aid and sucked up the development money and made very little difference to the lives of, of Afghans. And so it's hardly surprising that there is not a huge amount of sorrow in seeing us all depart, um, understandably. And what we need to do in the future is we need to change the conversation when it comes to rebuilding Afghanistan. And we need to give much more space to people like Haru. That's been uh, a challenge. But in many ways, Dr. Schuster, and, and I want to bring uh, Nasser and uh, Indra to the conversation as well. But, but I deliberately, I wanted to start with kind of making sure that the center of gravity for the conversation is and remains Afghanistan. 
you know, uh, Nasser, the uh, you've kind of lived through this in a in a part of the world that has gone through maybe four or five cycles of conflict driven uh, migration. Um, and, you know, whether it's uh, the host communities in Jordan, uh, it's the com complexity of Palestinian identity that, you know, is now 70 years deep, uh, or it's the more recent movement of Syrians into three or four countries, but I think profoundly Lebanon and the impact it's had on that country, uh, or the politics of a city like Istanbul. In all of these cases, the conversation about what happens to the hollowed out capability of Syria is not like a top 10 conversation. It's always about how Erdogan is treating the Syrians. Is he using the refugees as, as cannon fodder or as leverage uh, in his Kurd issue? Is he, uh, you know, wh what is Jordan doing? What is Lebanon doing? But what is going to happen to the ability of Syria to rebuild isn't, isn't a question that's ever really treated uh, with any degree of importance. My interest in this conversation, and one of the reasons we've organized this, you know, this panel and, and to, to have this conversation now, is to think more deeply about the challenge uh, that this vacuum, uh, that, that I think we all agree, uh, is being left in Afghanistan. What in your experience is going to happen next in Afghanistan? I'm not asking you to predict, but I'd love for you to just lay out kind of the lay of the land from, from the part of the world that you're from and, and in which you've worked for so many years. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Mushara, for, for having me. Uh, let me start with, by that. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just maybe revisit the subject of the conversation just, uh, just a little. Uh, if we're looking at, you know, what are the implications of an out migration uh, from Afghanistan, I think it's worth spending uh, some time talking about what the main drivers of that out-migration is. And I think it's namely it's two things, the security situation on the one hand, and uh, what uh, everyone else on this panel has alluded to, how the Taliban uh, govern and run the country. Uh, on the security situation, the country already has a significant assembly of uh, non-state actors who are not harmonious and they're working against each other. Uh, and if the Taliban are unable to hold the country together and be a provider of security and have a monopoly on the use of force, I think uh, this will lead to a further uh, fragmentation or balkanization of the country um, into a patchwork of statelets, so to speak, um, and a battleground between different uh, groups. Um, so this absence of security, I think, is um, an invitation for an influx of um, foreign fighters, a la Syria or Libya or other countries as well in my region. And ironically, this in-migration risks uh, the already delicate balance of communal and tribal power and relationships and will be a main driver for out-migration, uh, a two-way street, so to speak, of refugees going in one way and fighters going the other. So I think the Taliban should be very cautious in considering how welcoming they want Afghanistan uh, to be to non-Afghanis who want to live out their fantasy of living in an Islamic uh, state, who are drawn to violence uh, and strongly buy in to the narrative of a Taliban victory over the United States and find that as a calling or rallying cry uh, for their relocation or their recruitment to take up arms in the country. A non-state uh, actor holding a territory has tremendous recruiting and propaganda appeal. Um, but to quote my friend uh, Rolf Schwartz, who previously was at uh, NATO, Security is a precondition for the state fulfilling its two other functions, welfare and representation. And so the Taliban have to figure out if they're a state with an army or an army with a state um, in reference to you know, Prussia, what was said about Prussia previously uh, in the past, sorry. So the second driver of out-migration, as I said earlier, is the and other panelists have said, has been uh, how they run the country and how they rule the country. 
I'm a big believer in the idea uh, that violence and terrorism thrive in areas where governance has failed. And this is, uh, uh, applies uh, globally. Uh, as you said last week, uh, Musharraf, uh, call it what you will, a caliphate, an emirate, a republic, the Taliban needs to deliver for the people. It has to have a people-centric approach. And uh, at the forefront of this is the need to be inclusive and respectful of the rights of everyone, especially minorities. Uh, the need to find some form of reconciliation and assurances and to find some homegrown political solution that works for the country and avoid setting off this cycle of revenge and retribution and violence. Uh, Afghanistan has about 45% of its population uh, below the age of 15, which means that uh, uh, you know, half, about half the population has no memory uh, of uh, previous Taliban rule. The last time they were in power there, there wasn't even uh, internet uh, there. Things have changed considerably uh, in the country, in the world, and they can't rule in the same way uh, that they did previously, prioritizing their ideology over more pressing functional governance issues without expecting uh, further instability. The key issue is whether, uh, as everyone has alluded to, whether they'll be able to preserve what remains of the state and governance structures or whether we're already beyond that point. Um, I don't want to seem overly idealistic or uh, unrealistic at the prospects, uh, but we're all, as you said, clinging to straws. We're all looking for, um, you know, or are trying to be hopeful that it's not too far gone. Uh, if they've learned anything from the US uh, uh, presence in the country, it should be that military solutions alone uh, won't won't cut it. Um, what we have learned from our region, and you know, just as a disclaimer, I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, of any official uh, or Jordanian organization. These views are my own. Is that uh, you know the conversation is not taking place, as you said, uh, Musharraf. We've seen brain drain from uh, conflict. Uh, stricken uh, countries in my region. You mentioned Syria, you mentioned uh, uh, Lebanon, but also I would add to that list Iraq. Um, and, you know, there are about 7 million officially registered refugees uh, in my region. There are about 12 million internally displaced people in my region. But what I find uh, most interesting is that the top source countries for refugees uh, rank the most critical on the fragile states index. Um, and what I would say, aside from the absence of that conversation, is that countries like Jordan, Pakistan, Turkey, and others who have been such host, such big hosts of refugee populations over the, the decades, they're not leading the conversation on this. Uh, we're actually uh, in listening mode to the international community, and I commend Dr. Lisa for actually calling it out. You know, it's uh, in many ways it's become an industry and a, and a uh, uh, to a certain extent a, a business. Um, maybe I'll I'll end there, um, uh, Musharraf. Yeah, thanks. I think you were just getting warmed up, uh, but uh, but I but I appreciate where where you were going with this. I think it sets it up perfectly, Indrika as the representative, the resident representative of, uh, of the international community, uh, if you will, obviously not in a formal capacity and not in this conversation, but you do in many ways, you've spent your career um, working for organizations that do dominate the discourse. And though you yourself and your own background, I'll let you speak a little bit more about that because I think it, it does relate to the conversation we're having. Uh, for viewers that don't know, Indrika is from uh, from the island uh, nation of uh, Sri Lanka, a country that has seen its own uh, sort of extremely brutal um, conflict and, and that has generated a substantial conversation around brain drain. Uh, but, but Indrika, you know, this question of these countries not leading the conversation, I mean, the easy answer is these countries are also either fairly or unfairly seen as parties to the conflicts that generate these crises. And therefore, I think there's an ability for countries or Western powers in particular to kind of exclude them or keep them at the outside of the table as far as what happens. 
But there's another more complicating element, right, Indrika, which is that, you know, the, the, the best talented refugees or migrants from many countries, including out migrants from a country like Pakistan, the highest and top shelf talent in, in this country ends up in New York or, or London. And then the second tier maybe ends up in some other places. And then the third tier is what gets left behind. In a, in a crisis situation like the one in Afghanistan, that is on sort of, that's on speed. And, and it's even more profound. Anybody with any talent is trying to get through the door. And for countries like Iran and Pakistan, the, the people that will be left behind in, the, in Pakistan will not be people who thought, hey, man, what's a great place that I could go and live? It's Peshawar or it's Karachi. That, that's not the conversation. The conversation is what's the closest exit door? And then I'll see how I can get where I need to get. Given that being the case, how have you found uh, both your experience with Pakistan and Afghan refugees, but more broadly, how have you found countries being able to manage or, or create some sort of equilibrium in how they assess this? And are they then able to value refugees for their human capital at all? Or is the conversation almost always the refugees are a burden? Because that's very aligned with more Western populist uh, sort of uh, narratives. Uh, and, and something that for me as a Pakistani is a real problem in the gut. Thank you, Musharraf. Thanks for having me here. Maybe just, uh, I'll just take a step back and, and say, uh, talking of the narrative and the conversation, it, it uh, is telling that right now, the narrative that's dominating is Afghans who are leaving Afghanistan and the focus on Kabul airport. It's almost as if um, the other 38 million Afghans who are remaining in Afghanistan are not actually attention worthy. And the whole focus is on that. And uh, it is what it is in terms of how it's presented, but that's telling in its own sense. Uh, Afghanistan at this point of time, and just even before what the recent incidents of um, the collapse of uh, Kabul was heading towards a dire situation in terms of food insecurity. 19 million people are food insecure in the country. Um, half a million people have been displaced internally because of conflict just this year alone, adding to the 2.9 million who were displaced internally last year. So the focus right now, because of the tragic events that have transpired, is very much on people leaving grasping that opportunity to leave. And I dare say there are individuals who really want to uh, uh, find, as, as uh, uh, my colleagues in the panel were saying, have that physical security and safety and are so anxious and want to find that space. But how about the Afghans remaining in the country? Um, what about their aspirations, hopes, fears? Uh, this seems to be kind of off, off the grid at the moment, uh, subsumed by what's happening right now. So I, I'm just framing it in that manner to also pick up the point of what uh, the previous panelists and you were alluding to saying, okay, so now now what? Now what? How does how does the, the state of Afghanistan function? Uh, and one part of it, as you were saying, was the, the talent, uh, those who saw hopelessness in, in their space, uh, insecurity in their space, taking the opportunity and leaving. But there are others, and I think Arun is, is a great example, there are others there waiting, trying to make a difference, looking at the issues, articulating the challenges, wanting that support to have that space to be part of, of, of that narrative, to be part of that conversation, to make that difference. And right now, I think, if you look at the drivers, as, as Nasser was saying, very clearly, the insecurity, the violence that has led to that, uh, let's call it, uh, human security being challenged in every sense. And then leading up to the economic angle, economic angle of uh, how do you survive? How do you put food on the table? These compound, I think, are already the anxieties for, for many on the Afghans. And I'm not sitting here trying to speak. I think Harun laid it out very well when he spoke about it. But looking at out-migration, um, Musharraf, um, you know, if we look at 20 years ago when, when the Taliban was was removed um, with a certain geopolitical security developments in the region. 
um, there were millions of Afghan refugees in Iran, in Pakistan, outside, and millions came back. But millions didn't come to a developed, thriving, prosperous Afghanistan. They came back to Afghanistan with hope, with aspirations, wanting to be part of that nation building endeavor, right? And millions, uh, 5.3 million Afghans went, have come back in the last 20, 20 years. And of course, that dramatically reduced after the first 10 years. But there was that hope that wants to return. And as Lisa said, very much identifying uh, with Afghanistan and 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 the roots there, and that has that hope has been shattered. That hope has uh, it's, it's been let down by the leadership, uh, the international community. Uh, have we learned the lessons from from the past? And that's that is the sad epitaph in a way where we we speak today. And um, if you look at just um, the as as uh, Lisa was saying, the the reservoir of talent. Um, it's there in Afghanistan still. And if the Taliban looks at the demographics and has rightly pointed out, there's a whole generation that was born in the last 20 years who have different aspirations, who acquire different skills, who aspire to have, see a different Afghanistan. If they see also no hope in the future and the Taliban doesn't recognize this change of, of the demographic and do not let's put it uh, frankly, walk the talk we're hearing, then it's going to be an extremely challenging future for, for all those who have those hopes. And there, I think, um, looking at even the, 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 the human nature is such that is, of course, you anybody will try to go to the greenest pasture, uh, and that's human nature, and that's nothing unique to, to Afghanistan. Many, many individuals look at this even, even when going for for the job, you go for the best job with the best pay for your qualifications, right? If you get a lesser job, you don't go for lesser pay. You don't go for that. So, seeking the greenest pasture is is normal. It's 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 not it's not a phenomenon that's unique here. But what about also all the Afghans who are in the countries in the in the region in in Pakistan in Iran, who are second third generation Afghans who have gone to school who've learned, looking across the border, even they now are looking rather hopelessly at what's evolving in Afghanistan. So how does one retain the talent? I think the, the colleagues have just spelled it out very clearly. If the Taliban walks the talk and creates that space and the confidence and has the ability to generate some confidence amongst particularly the young Afghan uh, men and women that yes, we can contribute and be part of this effort, there is going to be some hope. If not, as Lisa was saying, it's going to be a spiral of hopelessness and finding the first opportunity to go across. And there it becomes also a, a, one more challenge, Mushraf, that we have to factor in here is once the lens closes, I mean, in terms of the media lens closes on Kabul on the 31st August, then what? People might start moving to the borders. And there you have countries who are saying, hang on a minute, We've hosted refugees for four decades. We were developing countries with our own challenges. We shared our resources. We've had uh, our Afghan brothers and sisters over. And now more because of a failed endeavor across the border. Why should we open our borders again? We have our own challenges. We have COVID, we have public health challenges, uh, economic uh, uh, impact of COVID. All these factors are going to play in. How do you convince, let's take Pakistan, for example, uh, 1.4 million registered refugees right now in Pakistan, another million uh, documented migrant uh, uh, card holders, and another 500,000 plus undocumented Iran and almost a million registered Afghan refugees and more than a million and a half uh, other um, Afghans on, on his territory how do you convince them now to say okay open it open the borders again let's uh, let's be hospitable and then the international community is also saying because of competing humanitarian disasters the resources are less we want to share the burden but there are challenges and the two host countries will turn around and say um, Okay, you say burden sharing. Where's the burden sharing? Where's the predictable burden sharing? And I think Nasser said it uh, uh, very, very poignantly. 80% of the world's refugees are hosted by the global south. 
by developing countries, right? I think the exception here, if you look at uh, for the, the Afghan refugees, is Germany. Uh, but if not, it's, Afghan, uh, it's Pakistan, it's Iran, and, and the Global South that's hosting the refugees. So, but there is a human capital there. There is a human capital in, in, in both the countries. And how do you even convince a refugee who's there to come back in these circumstances? And it comes back again to the point colleagues are making at this point. If the Taliban does not perceive the changes that have taken place, the demographics, the aspirations, and the idea that an individual who does not have security in, in their personal space, in their economic space, you are not going to be there. They're going to seek the first opportunity to go. And uh, that stark reality has to be dealt with. It's one thing to fight and win a war. It's another thing to govern a country. And you need that human capital in your country. So people will only be convinced, and I think Harun made this point at the very beginning, with the actions. They have seen what's happened before. They need to be convinced that this is a different approach. I think I'll stop there for the moment, Musharraf. Yeah, well, thanks, Indrika. And I think, you know, I. I I want the, today. Today's con I mean, it can go in any direction. It should be organic. But I think you know the, the issues that Iran or Pakistan or I think Uzbekistan and Tajikistan need to be part of that conversation as well. Increasingly, Tajikistan. We saw some pretty strong uh, sentiments from the Tajik president day before yesterday in a, in, a, in an actual official formal statement about what their expectations of the Taliban are. And I think that that increased attention to those Central Asian states is vital because the Taliban also need to understand that they're not dealing with a single client. They're dealing with multiple clients with legitimate interests that need to be addressed. And, and so, but but I, want, I, I think that would take away the focus from, from the situation in Afghanistan. And I want to go back to you, Harun. You know, quite rightly, as Indrika said, the people that remain in Afghanistan, and there is, I mean, I think the, the silver lining clearly in the conversation so far is that there's a lot of Afghans who are still in Afghanistan who are capable, who are young, who are energetic, who represent a lot of hope uh, for the future of Afghanistan. But the warning that, that Dr. Schuster sort of implied or, or actually stated was whether those people are there because they have to be or whether they're there because they've been convinced that they can engage in a nation building exercise now, that, that, that the peace that you talked about that causes people to be excited is the overwhelming sentiment and that the fear of what the Taliban might do or might become or already are is the is the less dominant sentiment. Maybe maybe explain to, to all of us a whether where things are on that front right now and what are the things you think the Taliban would need to do specifically that would lend confidence to young Afghans to stay in their countries and, and serve the the nation building cause, Harun. Um, let me start talking about the human psychology, like Afghan psychology, uh, the best I can, um, given my own experience and the experience of people I talk to and the families and my family and friends and people I have, have contact with. And then I will come to the Taliban piece, what they're doing, what it would mean for the uh, for the um, Afghans who are making the choice to stay or leave. Uh, first of all. Um, my family. I was born a refugee in Iran. I, I was a, one of the one of the numbers referenced earlier. Um, and my family had fled the country during the Soviet invasion. So my father was part of the resistance. The life in Afghanistan became impossible. He was targeted multiple times. Our village was raided. He had to move to Iran. Um, and I just can tell you one thing that uh, our experience in Iran was not. Um, I mean, we're not in Iran because we chose to be in Iran, and we chose to be away from Afghanistan. I mean, uh, every year almost every month. I mean, the fact that Afghans are so good at, uh, they, they, were, they were famous for listening to BBC or other outlets, other outlets, it was just because they were looking to see where it would be okay for them to return. And there were different points in time where my family sold everything we had in, in Afghanistan, in, in Iran, coming to the border, literally coming to the border, hoping that they, that is the moment to go back and then being disappointed because the war again broke out. Um, that kind of was the dynamic of our lives in Iran, just basically on hold to see where we can go back, when we can go back. And in 2003, that, when my family returned to Afghanistan, we thought that was the moment to come back. And it was highlighted, it was highlighted in terms of human psychology. Um, at the time, Afghanistan did not have as many roads that it has right now. There were not as many, as many hospitals that there are right now. We did not have electricity. Many people, more people have electricity now than, than, than back then. There was no running water. 
Um, I mean, on any, like, uh, if you're looking at just infrastructure access and, and such, the, the situation was horrible compared to now uh, for most people, um, including, including my family and myself, but there was hope. So the psychology was like, there is opportunity to contribute. There's opportunity to build a life here in your home and let's do it. And a lot of people chose to do that. They came back, the generally um, millions, as you pointed out, came back. Over time, still, I think it was that dynamic. Some people would choose to leave because of their own circumstances, but a lot of people were just looking for a way to be, come back to Afghanistan. Um, that's just one piece of it. But now, um, Afghans, I think, um, who make a choice in terms of whether to stay, stay to leave at, at this point, uh, one piece of this kind of human psychology is that anyone I talk to, uh, and I'm talking to people who have, we would consider talent, and they message me and say, okay, we got a mess email from the embassy, from the government telling us, go to the airport. They call me and they want to consult me because um, they, they think I, would, I, would, I could, be, uh, could be of help. They're actually sobbing saying, I don't want to go. Uh, for different reasons. One is just the commitment to the land. They just don't, they, that's the life that they've had so far. They don't want to leave it. Uh, they built something, they, they, they don't want to just leave it. It's human nature. There is something there that people don't want to leave. There's also the fact that they have extended family. No one is taking away 20, 30 people on these planes or any other opportunities, even to Pakistan and Iran, the, the decision to choose means just you break up your family, literally just break up your family, sisters, brothers gonna be far away. No one wants to leave fam their families. So a lot of talents, given the choice even, like they, they have the email that would many people would see that that's the, that's a golden ticket. They don't wanna go, they, they, they struggle. Some choose to go eventually, but they it's a dreadful decision uh, to, to, uh, to do it. Um, that's kind of, one piece of it. The other piece of it is just that people are, some of them are refugee, they are, they have fatigue of just moving around. I mean, you have to realize that if you look at the numbers, internally displaced, combined with refugee population, almost every Afghan has experienced some, either has been a refugee at their point in time or internally displaced. So they've, they've been there. I mean, it's not like, okay, we're just going to figure out, let's go and see what it's like. They know what it's like. And it's been horrible for, for most of them, they've been horrible. And they don't want to go back and they are willing to tolerate a lot before they choose to leave. They are willing to tolerate a lot because they know the alternative. And in terms of the psychology of what it would mean to be a refugee, again, an internally displaced person who doesn't have a home again. Uh, but at the same time, that there are two kind of factors that make people stay. The other factor that would make people want to leave is that they tried it over the past 20 years to make something. And now they also have a fatigue of actually trying to build a country. They said, we tried 20 years. We tried to build something, it's all lost again. Why would I want to spend another 20 years? I talked to people who, until like days ago even, I'm not talking about months ago, would tell you that this is my land, I will die here, I'll be buried here, that's where I wanna be buried. Now they say, I don't want it, just with the help with all of this, I'm, I'm just, I'm, they're just throwing their hands and I'm just gonna go and don't, don't look back at all. Just So that's also there, if people are saying, okay, you want me to build something? I did try to build something for 20 years and now it's just wiped out. Why would I want to build it again? Uh, why would I have actually the motive to drive to actually do something to build it again? So that's, some of those kind of elements of psychology of making people want to stay, want to leave, and just how complicated and heartbreaking these decisions are for people. And it's not um, just like Europe is prettier or better place to live. Uh, let's go to Europe. That's really not the decision that people are making. They're horrible. These are horrible, gut-wrenching decisions people are making to leave brothers behind, leave sisters behind, leave mothers behind, leave fathers behind. It's not an easy decision for anyone. And they've experienced, and many of them have gone, from, maybe not to Europe, but they've been displaced. They have been refugees. Their parents were refugees. Their families were refugees. They really know what they're, what they're up for. Uh, in terms of what it would take for, for Afghanistan that is now, that as you point out, the 30 um, plus million people are just going to have to deal with this reality. What it would what it would be possible to be done that would make Afghanistan a livable place for those people? There are many pieces to it. Um, I think it would just some of it just require time and reconciliation. It's not something that would happen over time, but the, there needs to be trust built. Um, and um, th there is some hopeful rhetoric, but I would like to point out that that hopeful rhetoric can be easily contrasted with very very concerning policies and actions. Let me just go through the list very briefly. Uh, with regard to education, Taliban said education would not be touched. We're going to have some rules, but education is okay. But in terms of actual policy underground, they've only allowed elementary schools to open so far. Like even middle schools are like, wait for now. Um, and um, elementary schools for boys and girls go back. Middle school, wait. High school, wait. University, just wait. Um, and we're going to come up with rules for women, how they would do it. 
with regard to uh, women were being able to work. They said, we want a woman to join our government. We figured out how they can do it. Uh, that was the original reaction. There were some photos of people going to work women and it was celebrated. But later on, the Allah Mujahid said, let's put a pin on that as well, pin in that as well. We're just going to figure out how it's going to work for now. We, we don't believe our fighters or our members will be comfortable working in a co-ed environment to just go home for now. Uh, with regard to the issue of inclusive government, uh, there is there are talks, consultations going on that make people hopeful. But if all the appointments made so far, Minister of Public, Affair, uh, Public Work, Minister of Finance, the head of the central bank, governors, mayors, in Herod, where I'm from, mayor, all the way down to district, head of the district, um, a different district in the city, all the appointments, with no exceptions, have been uh, "quote unquote" mullahs, which would be like a, a mullavi, which would be like a group identification, like our people, and with no regard for uh, any sort of qualifications. So, if you are a person uh, who has struggling to leave, has obviously fatigue about building something that was just destroyed, and you also all dealing with all these family issues of okay, where I would go if I go even to the airport, I may get killed, I may go get stampede on, and all this going on. People in the other parts of the country, it's not 35 8 million people watching whether they will be able to live with dignity and make a livelihood in the country. They're watching all this happening and they feel like, okay, it is a, it's becoming the public space is becoming occupied by a certain group. Um, obviously, that group represents some people. I mean that that that. that that is true, but also it's an exclusionary. Uh, the actions and policies and appointments so far have been exclusionary. So the picture is complex, but the, the words that made us hopeful often are contrasted with actions that cause concern, at least give concerns to me. And I think we just have to wait to see what would come out of this, but I'm not very hopeful um, either. Um, it doesn't mean people are gonna give up. I'm sure there is gonna be pushback. There is gonna be people who are gonna try to make a difference but they're gonna have an uphill battle. Thanks, uh, Harun. You know, I, I hate to hear the words that you're not hopeful, but I also, I think the world needs to hear those words given how close uh, this is to you and how close you are to it. Uh, Dr. Schuster, in terms of your own, I mean, it's not really, I, I don't wanna personalize it, but, but I think it's useful because it helps people understand the, the processing of, of how people are making decisions. Let me, let me frame my question by almost an appeal or a plea. And that is that it seems to me that at this point in time, the more we can communicate to the Taliban and to governments around the world, particularly here in the region, but, but certainly uh, in the country that you're in, uh, Dr. Schuster and um, all around the world, that it seems that one of the most important tasks for the Taliban is to, is to fix that pessimism or, or that realism that Harun is expressing that in fact there's no basis for us to be hopeful because of what we've already seen over the last 11 days and what we know from 96 to 2001 and also what we know for the last 20 years because it wasn't like the Taliban disappeared and then reappeared there has been a consistency at least to their ideological uh, moorings and certainly to their investment in violence uh, and rigidity as their go-to uh, methods of engagement with society. If rigidity and extremism are their go-to methods, is it just a pipe dream to think about or to make a plea for scholars like you and for scholars like Harun to remain engaged so that they might be convinced and for you, you know, for voices that can make a difference to actually remain engaged and not disengage. Because I think one of the things I'm hearing, at least privately, from a lot of Afghan friends is, Musharraf, whatever, whatever you do, make sure that you promote engagement. Because if the world disengages from the Taliban, it's going to be worse for the people of Afghanistan. But that really puts a lot of us in, in a bind. And I'm sure most of all, somebody like you, uh, Liza, given that you know, you have a connection with this country, you've worked there, you've invested time, effort, intellect, heart and spirit there and, and, and brain. And you're now being asked to remain engaged with a regime that, you know, may not want you engaged or that may make it very difficult for you to engage. So using yourself maybe as a proxy for other Afghan talent that is still in country, how does, how does this dilemma get resolved? How do you find equilibrium that is fair uh, but also true to one's own principles and identity. 
sorry, you need to unmute. Um, thanks. I'm not sure. Am I unmuted? Great. Um, disengagement is not an option. As somebody who has spent most of the last 10 years in Afghanistan, I have a responsibility. I have debts to Afghans that I cannot walk away from. Um, and I think that's true for a number of us who have been privileged to work in Afghanistan. But at the same time, it's really important to understand, I don't have huge expectations of the Taliban. The Taliban have received support in Afghanistan over a number of years, largely because they have provided justice where the government has been unable to provide justice. And they have been seen as less corrupt than the government. So whatever support they have has been because of negative comparisons that have been made with the, the, the Islamic Republic. Nonetheless, what the, the Taliban are offering, their view of the world, is not a view that can be embraced by a generation of young Afghans who see the world in a different way, in particular when we look at women, but not just women, also young men. So the Taliban cannot achieve this Islamic state and create a country in which that young generation are going to want to live. So I don't see the Taliban being able to last. So long as they are in government, there is very little for this young generation of Afghans, and even for an older generation of Afghans. I mean, the first family that I lived with in Pulakhumri in Baghlan, the father of the family recounted to me his first impression of the Taliban when they arrived into Pulakhumri many years ago in the 1990s, and he remembered seeing women being beaten, and that for him was shocking. That's not what he wanted for his wife. That's not what his wife wanted or his daughters. So what the Taliban are promising is not what Afghans want in terms of this very repressive conservative view. Okay, there are some Afghans who do want it. But what Afghans want is they want justice. They want a lack of corruption. But they want the capacity to engage with the world. That is what they have been doing. That is what has produced people like Haroon and like the very many people that I have been working with. So, no, I don't have hope for a somehow just and benevolent Taliban government. That's not going to happen. What I have hope for is for a new government that will come back post the Taliban. I don't know what that's going to look like. I am very afraid of what it's going to take to get there, of the kind of violence and conflict that we're going to see. Um, and so I'm sorry, I can't offer you hope for the immediate future. I'm very afraid for what's going to happen to people in Afghanistan in the next three to four or five years. I wish I could yeah, say no, it's going to be wonderful. No, of course. Um, like I said, I think we all have to be true to what we know and, and what our identity is and yours is as a researcher and as somebody connected to Afghanistan in the way that you are. But but I... I I guess what I'm hearing also, and, and what I want to ask you to maybe expand on or explain a little bit is the the idea of kind of an alternative to what is in Afghanistan today, as you rightly said, probably entails an enormous amount of violence, uh, an enormous amount of conflict. And so that prognosis is suggesting continued conflict and war in, in a country where perhaps the only optimism as Harun framed earlier on, was the idea of many Afghans feeling not excited about the Taliban's arrival, but feeling excited about the end of the war. And so uh, I don't know whether maybe you, you can comment on what that would mean. Is there a version of the Taliban having taken over in which some sort of inclusive or participatory uh, or broad-based government is formed that can proxy as the kind of thing you're referring to as the post-Taliban. Because I think we we just got here and, and to get to a post-Taliban, might we might be another 10, 15, 20 years. What's the 
Uh, and and if it is, you know, there's no way to it without violence. So so ha is there a halfway uh, between those two options, or or do you see no no chance of that? I see what Harun saw, which is um, no space for Hazara in the government, or if there is. It will be one or two token people, the way we saw um, there were the occasional token Hazara governors, Rajiv governors. Um, there may be a token woman spokesperson, and it may be that that's enough for Western governments to engage and to pretend that everything is okay. Um, it's not. It's not acceptable. Um, I... I think the only thing that is going to stop an all-out conflict happening now is the exhaustion, the exhaustion of the Afghan people who have suffered so much over the last 40 years. Um, I think exhaustion and fear might mean that the, whatever resistance comes about doesn't occur for, for some months, maybe even a year or more, because people are just are tired. These these explosions, like yesterday, are a a punch to the gut, and it's very hard. You know, people pick themselves up, they go back to work, they open their shops again, but whether they have the determination, the perseverance, the courage, the strength to be able to fight again, I don't expect to see that in the immediate future. Um, I think people are very, very tired. And it's really hard, you know? It's not like people can say, we had this wonderful, amazing government that brought us justice and peace and happiness in the last 20 years. No, it didn't. And so it's very hard to ask people to fight for a government that was corrupt, incompetent, led by people who were there because of their connections and not because of their qualifications, as Arun has said. Um, so I'm sorry, but my view, I, I, and, and for the sake no, of people please, like Haroon, I wish I was wrong. Yeah. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't apologize. You've you've said sorry a number of times, and I think that's a problem. So, uh, thank you for sharing your views as they are. There's no there's no need for any of us to apologize for them. Uh, Nasser, in a sense, maybe you or or rather the region you live in has been there and done that. I mean, frankly, so has this one, but. But since we are, at least I certainly am, trying very hard to clutch at straws, is there any version of the story that doesn't end up in a renewed conflict to try and find that perfect? I, I, I don't mean to minimize uh, Dr. Schuster's framing, but, but you know, the extreme version of it is, you know, this perfect idealized uh, Westphalian kind of governance structure in Afghanistan. It wasn't certainly achieved in the last 20 years, but there's no reason why Afghans should be forced to dream in black and white when everybody else gets to dream in 4K. I think that's really the, the, the kind of turning point for a lot of people or, the, or the, the point of departure is, why should this, whatever this is in Kabul right now, I'm not sure what we can call it, but certainly a Taliban ascendancy, why should this be okay for Afghan children, Afghan women and Afghan men uh, when it isn't for people born in other places? And so I think, if that's the starting point of the debate, is there any reason for us to be hopeful? Has it turned out differently? It seems to me, and again, I'm going to go to Syria as the maybe the more most current example. There's no version of Syria that's dramatically better than the previous regime, whatever whatever you might want to call it. Um, am I? Are we all being too too gloomy, uh, or or is this real? Is this the way it is? Well, you know, Musharraf, I, I would say two things. Uh, one is that the full extent of conflicts in my region still haven't uh, come to, uh, uh, to an end either. I mean, uh, w w you mentioned Syria, how functional a, a, a country, a state is Syria, how centrally governed is that state. You know, we've had generations of children out of school. Same applies to Iraq. Same applies to other places uh, in my region, including the Palestinian diaspora or those who are still living inside Palestine. So I really don't have any um, you know, silver linings to share on the one hand. But uh, 
I would uh, also add uh, to something that uh, Dr. Uh, Lisa mentioned about uh, how people have a tendency to welcome uh, groups uh, like the Taliban uh, at their arrival. Uh, and we saw this with ISIS because of what's called the, uh, the predictability of terror. Uh, people, um, and this applies to crime as well. I mean, people welcome the mob uh, in their neighborhoods because uh, they want protection from um, from uh, uh, from one uh, entity. They don't want to have to pay multiple bribes. Uh, they want uh, somebody to deliver justice swiftly. Um, and I think this is uh, this is what we're seeing. Um, in Afghanistan at this moment. And, you know, we're still, I think, at a stage where uh, we're uh, in, engaged in some collective sense-making on, on, on what that means. Clearly, it's not the kind of uh, government that uh, anyone wants in Afghanistan, but it is a reality. And we have to deal with it accordingly. And I would echo uh, the sentiment of the panelists that uh, uh, isolating and sanctioning maybe aren't or disengaging uh, aren't necessarily the the, the right uh, levers uh, and you know i think the international community really must learn uh, the the main lesson of the 90s is that when it abandoned afghanistan we we saw the outcome and we can't expect a different uh, outcome if we choose that path this time around either Nasser, and Rika, the, the, the next few weeks, I suspect, will be ones in which uh, you and your organization will be focusing on the immediate humanitarian crisis. We have people that want to exit Afghanistan, not just at the Hamid Karzai International Airport, but also at uh, Torham uh, on the border crossing into Khyber Pakhtunkhwa uh, near Peshawar. And of course, we have the very large and I would say much more complicated spin Baldak and Chaman crossing in Balochistan. Uh, we have similar crossings in Iran and there's varying degrees of preparation, I think, between Iran and Pakistan. Also, both countries treat their refugees, uh, I think, fundamentally differently, but certainly there are some obvious differences, including freedom of mobility, which is not afforded to refugees in, in Iran. Uh, you know, restriction to camps, which is, uh, you know, abided by in Iran. Uh, and also, I think, sectarian sort of linkages or exploitation. Certainly, Pakistan is not uh, innocent on that front, but I think in terms of uh, more explicit exploitation, uh, you know, that's something that seems to be uh, aligned more with Iran than with Pakistan. With all the existing, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned the concern you have for these host countries, uh, but surely the, the the primary concern that you have and, and that I think everyone should be focused on is the well-being uh, and opportunities for these refugees. Uh, so many times we've seen Afghan refugees become a ping pong or, or you know a football that's kicked around as a political issue without considering the again the human capital and that that's why I keep going back to that terminology right what we're seeing in Afghanistan is capital flight but not of the kind that we see in financial crises uh, we're seeing a capital a human capital flight uh, you know and and whether we can rejig that or reframe that to ensure that the reception to these migrants refugees to this human capital is different this time than it has been in the past so that there is no framing of refugees as a burden, but as an opportunity for engagement and an opportunity for an upscaling or a premier, pre premiering of human capital. Do you, again, is that too optimistic? And, and are you absolutely certain that we're going to end up in the same loop that we've been in, in for 40 years as far as the movement of Afghan refugees? Or do you see any hope for us to be, you know, to, to kind of maybe bank on these neighboring countries to treat Afghan refugees differently. Uh, anytime any refugees are welcome in a society is a good thing. So to take nothing away from the past for these countries, but they can certainly do a lot better. And I just want to get your sense of whether that is on the cards at all or not, Indrika. 
Thank you, Mishraf. I think you know, your question is a bit unfair because in, in my line of work, you have to be hopeful, right? And and uh, um, as, as Desmond Tutu said once, he said, uh, when somebody said, you know, you're such a, you're a, such an optimist, you just go and your energy is always there. How come despite all the challenges, you remain so engaged, so optimistic? He said, I'm not an incurable optimist i'm a prisoner of hope so i think in a sense it's it's about we, we have to we have no choice but to work towards that to answer your question maybe maybe two points right uh, right now again i come back to the, the the tragic drama unfolding in in the airport there were people who needed resettlement in third countries afghan refugees who genuinely needed that option and um with competing humanitarian crises, those those that those in need were over the last four decades, those opportunities lessened and lessened and lessened. So um, right now, there is focus on um, um, people who worked with the uh, the uh, ISA forces who uh, committed and engaged. Um, I, I dare say there are concerns there, and that's not a bad thing that they have opportunities. But there were those also for many decades who needed opportunities and uh, those opportunities weren't necessarily materializing for them. So that's one part of the equation. The second part, I think, is also, uh, as, as Dr. Lisa was talking about, the exhaustion of conflict and the, the sapping of energy, which also says, you know, now come and change what again, how many times? And, and, and uh, Harun mentioned a very important point as well about how, Afghans have come back, gone back, displaced again, moved back again to host countries. Then there was a glimmer of hope. You packed up, you took everything and came back again. Uh, so it's multiple displacements as well that have impacted them over the years for four decades. So that also, you know, it saturates anybody's coping uh, mechanisms, right? And, and, and in this particular context with COVID and everything else has even added another layer of vulnerability. So. And here you have on the other side of the border also uh, host countries with their own challenges and keeping the geopolitics out of hosting for a moment to say, you know, a community who had refugees coming to them is, is, is not, they're not the power brokers, they're communities that live together. Um, they're saturated as well. So they feel, now what? And that, I think, is part of the challenge to really show which is the reality that Afghans have contributed in host countries. They are not a burden. They are a human capital. Young people come, they work, they generate uh, uh, resources, even uh, skilled or unskilled. That, that contribution is often lost in the politicized narrative because that is something becomes a, which becomes an inconvenient truth. And this is also something we got to really uh, push forward and embrace uh, politically charged often, sadly, uh, domestically caught in many of the countries, whether it's East or West, uh, uh, refugees, migrants, the others, the burden, taking our resources is always a narrative that's pushed. Uh, inclusion is seen as a threat as opposed to an opportunity to embrace. So am I optimistic that that narrative will change overnight? No, I'm not. But uh, that doesn't mean we should we should keep at it and making that point about uh, the contribution that refugees make and uh, push that through because there's no other choice. What is what is what other choice do we have to to uh, but to work on that to give give some hope? And lastly, I think also again coming back to the millions of Afghans remaining in Afghanistan, I think the international community owes to be engaged and support. The, the Afghans who by and large have lost hope because of all the machinations that happened beyond their control in very many ways. I'm talking about the average civilian. I'm not talking about the elite and the power brokers. So that, that's part of the challenge. And as Harun says, if you're trying to, in, well, inspire is the wrong word. If you're trying to ignite even that little bit of hope, um, I I don't, as, 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 as a Pragmatists maybe don't see an option, but not to see and put pressure and, and try to uh, ensure whatever inclusive approach is meaningful. It might not come to that, but at least you got to try. Because if not, what is the option again? A descent into further chaos. And, and uh, the neighboring countries are saturated. They're tired. 
and they will also not be as welcoming. So, you know, the Afghans get caught in a rock and a hard place yet again uh, in this kind of situation. So, um, advocating for open borders, people to have access to protection, those who need it, who, who, who are searching for it, is imperative. I think um, trying to really um, work, look at how those commitments are adhered to, and if not doing something about it, not just acquiescing, I think that is important. And lastly, but just to stay the course of somehow supporting the Afghans who remain in Afghanistan. I'm afraid that once the focus of Kabul airport and everybody says we've ticked the box, we've taken our people out, good, you forget about the 38 million Afghans remaining. Wonderful, it's impressive, it's a gesture of, of generosity for sure, of taking 100,000 people in two weeks, but how about the 38 million who remain? You know, and too many times has Afghanistan fallen off the grid when everybody else's interests uh, uh, went another way, and uh, you, you you forgot about uh, Afghanistan and the Afghans, and suddenly it blips up again. And just to close, uh, to to with a point and point, uh, the 25th of August was the fourth year of when you had the genocide. Uh, or the tragic events that happened in uh, Rakhine State with the Rohingya. This time, there wasn't a blip. It was subsumed by Afghanistan, tragic as it is. So this also is symptomatic of attention wanes and comes in the international world. There's a million Rohingya in, in scholarly camps uh, right now as we speak. But that, that went without a murmur, in a way, uh, 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 on the 25th of August. So again, we got to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I think it's uh, all the voices here uh, and or everybody should try to make sure that that focus remains in how we go about supporting uh, Afghans in Afghanistan and, and, and let leaders like Harun and others really, you know, be behind them and support them is incredibly important moving forward. You know, I uh, thank you, Indrika. Uh, I, I have so many more questions, Nasir, with you. I wanted to ask about you know, how the chances for the UN, especially agencies like UNHCR, how those are going to be affected by the kind of shifting sands of multilateral engagement. There seems to be a real emphasis on the SCO, and there seems to be a real absence of the UN. Uh, the UN Sec Gen, uh, the personal envoy of the United Nations Secretary General, uh, Jean Arnaud, others seem to not have been as robustly engaged over the last week, 10 days, as maybe we might expect, but there seems to be a lot more engagement from regional powers. How does that affect everything? Before you answer that, what I wanted to say is we're running up on time, and I value everyone's time, particularly the panels, and, and uh, how grateful I am for you having made time. I will express to you well, personally, but I but I express it here in the shortest version by saying thank you. Uh, Nasir, if you wanted to have any concluding thoughts, including maybe addressing this uh, how, how how the humanitarian uh, crisis and how it's dealt with will change because of these shifting sands of the, the, the political economy of multilateralism, if you will? Uh, it's a great uh, question, actually, Musharraf, and, and there's no easy answer for that. Uh, and multilateral system is, um, is struggling, I would say, right now, uh, or, uh, and is still maybe... Uh, 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 reeling from the uh, impact of uh, uh, populism and nationalism uh, and the withdrawal of the U.S. as a main multilateral actor over the past four years uh, and still rebuilding. But one thing that I did want to point out uh, regarding the refugee response, and maybe this is a topic for another discussion, but I think it will be a precedent to have a refugee crisis during a pandemic and I'm not sure we've really thought through what the implications uh, of that is on the global efforts uh, to fight uh, COVID, both for our transit and uh, host countries. And if I were to maybe just uh, offer my uh, humble, uh, modest advice uh, to UNHCR would be to, to, to be thinking about uh, that. Thank you. Thanks, Nasir. Uh Dr. Schuster, any sort of concluding thoughts, reactions to what Indrika or Nasir have said before we wrap up? Um, 
some a group of people that I think it's very important we don't forget. Afghanistan is currently hosting hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people who have been displaced not just recently, but some people have been displaced for up to 16 years. Many of those people are living in, appropriate, in inappropriate accommodation, like in tents, in shelters. There are many millions of Afghans who do not have enough to eat and children who um, aren't going to school and are malnourished. Winter will be here relatively quickly. And so there is going to be another humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan. We need to do something about that. We need to keep the focus on Afghanistan even after the airport closes and regardless of what the Taliban do. I couldn't agree more. Um, Indrika, any final thoughts before I ask Harun to kind of close out with his with his final thoughts? I mean, I'm just echoing exactly what Dr. Lisa said. It's that we have a commitment to stay and deliver and be with the Afghan people, regardless of, of the regime in there. And that we, we, just like we are asking the Taliban to walk the talk, we need to walk the talk as well. Thanks, uh, Indrika. Uh, Harun, over to you. I mean, you've heard the conversation. Uh, we've tried to hear you. I think everything that you've said is incredibly vital. I, I speak for others as well that are watching and members of my team, and they found what you had to say so powerful. And so I, I, I want to thank you for just being with us, but also speaking so clearly and so cogently. You in yourself are a representation of the human capital that is the richness of Afghanistan. And uh, I, actually, I don't need any hope uh, any beyond beyond knowing that you're out there. And there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of young women and men uh, like you uh, that love their country dearly and are going to be the answer to whatever the question is, inshallah. But uh, I just wanted to hand over to you to close out. And, uh, and when you're done, we're going to wrap up. Thanks. No, thank you so much. Obviously, you're too kind. Um, and I would like to echo everything that was said before in terms of the need for the engagement to continue from the international community um, um, beyond August 31st deadline, obviously. Um, just from an internal perspective, just looking at an Afghan uh, ahead, thinking like what can be done and what is likely to happen. Um, I believe the only solution is for Afghanistan to become a place where Afghans can live. Um, there is no way to have a 38, 35, we don't have census in Afghanistan, but there's no way to find a way to kind of a place for that many people outside of Afghanistan. That's just not going to happen. And uh, the ones who are going to remain, which are going to be the overwhelming majority of Afghans, just going to have to make Afghanistan a place where they can live where the dreams can come true, where their hopes um, would have a chance of actually materializing. Uh, how it's going gonna, it's gonna to play out is going to be in reaction, in tension, in uh, struggle with an uh, ideologically driven oppressive group. I mean, that, that's, there's no, really, no other way to put it. Um, but it is the fight that is going to be the fight that Afghans have to fight. And I believe that this time, um, the only way to find to break the cycle would be to fight it politically, not uh, through violence. I do. I might. I believe the only way out of this crisis and this cycle of. I mean, as I said, it was happened so many times over the street. The only way to break the cycle is to engage in political struggle against a brutal, uh, uh, um, oppressive, uh, and uh, ideologically driven group that is holding power now. I'm uh, in a best case scenario. I hope that the Taliban would uh, open up the space that would allow for Afghans to fight for that, to struggle for that in any way they can without using violence. Because if I think, I believe if the currency becomes violence, then the worst uh, will become powerful. That's what happened in Afghanistan in the past. If it's a matter of uh, people picking up guns, the most violent, the most extremist elements going to dominate the conversation. I think Afghans showing up in public, just showing defiance and speaking up, um, women and men, and um, forcing Taliban to deal with them and, and, and realize their presence, acknowledge their presence, their wants, their desires, going to be the way forward. I think it's going to be uh, Taliban are going to try to oppress, they're trying to, I'm sorry, this is far past, but they're, they're trying to close that political space. It's going to be a very hard struggle. 
but I think that's the one struggle that's going to matter um, in, in a kind of a long, um, kind of long run, big picture uh, uh, in the lives of 38 million people. I'm, I'm committed to that struggle, um, and I think a lot of Afghans are um, leaving Afghanistan is not an option. Even if those, for those who can leave, they're going to leave part of their life behind, their families, their just their heart, and. I'm just hoping that political struggle plays out in a way that would lead us to the state that uh, Dr. Lisa was talking about, a post-Taliban state, meaning that we would transition towards a space uh, that we had through political struggle against Taliban, through defiance, through resistance, through a uh, political fight against Taliban, we get to a space that it's, um, uh, there is more room for Afghans together to um, come up with a place where every Afghan can, can live with dignity and and and, and see a place where they can actually um, realize dreams and hopes. I think that's the best note uh, for us to wrap up on. Harun Rahimi, uh, thank you. Dr. Liza Schuster, thank you. Nasir bin Nasir, thank you. And Indrika Radwate, all, all four of you, uh, as fully expected, uh, were, were fantastic. Again, I want to make a particular note of the value and importance of your voice, Harun. And I'm grateful that you shared it with us. Uh, to everybody watching, we'll be back here doing this again uh, very soon. And, and I hope we'll be able to invite all of you, Nasir, Indrika, Harun, and uh, Dr. Schuster, back to talk more about these issues and others, inshallah. God bless you and uh, take care. Thank you.